Hello, I'm Anna Raimonti coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. Today we have three guests who I'm very excited to be speaking with. We have Karen Newell, Dr. Eben Alexander, and Dr. Anna Yusim. So Karen has spent a lifetime seeking wisdom through esoteric teachings and firsthand experience exploring the realms of consciousness. She empowers others by demonstrating how to connect to inner guidance, achieve inspiration, improve wellness, and develop intuition. She's the co-author of Sacred Acoustics and co-authored with Dr. Alexander, Living in the Mindful Universe. So welcome, Karen. Acad Thank you. You're very welcome. Academic neurosurgeon, Dr. Eben Alexander, career includes decades in a, as a physician and associate professor at Harvard University Medical School and other revered teaching hospitals. He once believed that the physical world was all that existed. His scientific belief system was altered in 2008 when he experienced a near-death life experience and he went on to write Proof of Heaven and other books. Welcome. Anna, thanks so much for having us on. It's great to be here. Oh, welcome. Dr. Anna Sim is a world-renowned and award-winning Stanford and Yale-educated board-certified psychiatrist and on the clinical faculty at Yale Medical School. Anna is the best-selling author of Fulfilled, How the Science of Spirituality Can Help You Live a Happier, More Meaningful Life. She's presently creating a spiritual spirituality and mental health Institute at Yale, making a feature full length documentary on the interface of mental health and spirituality and really exciting in the process of co-authoring a book with me. So we're really excited about that. So welcome Anna, welcome Eben, welcome Karen. I'm so happy to have the three of you here. So um, I wanted to talk to you about um, sacred acoustics um, and binaural beats um, and, you know, everything associated with that. If, um, Karen, can you talk to me about um, how you got involved with this, um, with Dr. Alexander? Well, uh, yes, I think you're wanting to know too about the sound and uh, sacred acoustics, which is where we found our common ground. And uh, it all started when I was trying to learn how to meditate. It was very challenging to quiet the mind. I was very interested in exploring how our body's energy works, you know, what my higher self might be having to say. And you really needed to learn how to meditate in order to be involved in those sorts of things. And so it was very hard. I have a Western mind, like all of us who have this constant racing thoughts going through our head, often not related at all to what we're doing in that moment. And it was sound, a particular quality of sound that really helped me to quiet the mind and find that ability to move beyond the here and now physical world to that more expansive kind of spiritual sense of who we are. And so these sounds are like, you know, uh, a brass bowl or tuning forks, anything that has kind of this wah, wah, wah sound or even a gong. But these binaural beats that Sacred Acoustics creates are just digital creations of similar sounds that are created very precisely to help support these lower brainwave states of awareness that are like theta and delta and alpha that are very useful for helping to quiet the mind. And how exactly does that happen? How do they quiet the mind? Well, I think that uh, Eben is probably good at uh, addressing that one. Well, I, I would say we're still uh, speculating about exactly what all the mechanisms are, but I think a good working hypothesis, especially given kind of the power that, uh, uh, that has been demonstrated through these techniques, so not just in our hands, but uh, other others using binaural beats in the 20th century for things like enhancing out-of-body experiences and remote viewing. Um, but I think uh, from my point of view, uh, the best way to look at it is that these sounds uh, actually influence the lower brainstem. They, uh, 
It's very different from any other sound you've ever heard, and that includes sounds that may have engendered transcendental states of conscious awareness, like chants or anthems or hymns. Those are all processed up into the um, acoustic cortex of the temporal lobes and circuits that have basically uh, developed over the last few million years in primates and, and uh, uh, human beings. Uh, and yet the, the, the sacred acoustics and similar uh, uh, binaural uh, beat brainwave entrainment, those sounds actually influence the circuit way down in the lower brainstem. And I believe the reason that's important is because there's a general principle in evolutionary biology that if you want to understand more about a certain function, say, for example, consciousness, that you really want to look at not only the anatomy, but the evolution in the various physical structures that we, are, we see associated. That would be the brain and brainstem, in this case, the central nervous system. Uh, and it's this oscillation that is going on in the lower brainstem with these uh, uh, slightly different frequencies to the two ears that actually influences an ancient circuit. It's known as the superior olivary nuclear complex. Um, and it's by driving that. And it, it turns out that that same region of the brain um, also uh, through hypnosis, through uh, uh, EMDR for PTSD, you know, um, um, reprocessing and desensitization. All these things involve slow left-right oscillations in the lower brainstem. And I believe that is what is actually setting consciousness free, uh, is learning to ride these tones. You, uh, you really uh, do uh, get broad experiences that uh, are seem to be detached from the kind of here and now in the physical brain and body. And I believe that's, that's a mechanism that we need to really focus on. I think that's where the magic of this technology comes from. And I just wanted to add the way Evan and I found common ground on this is that after his coma journey that gave him that incredible spiritual experience, he was looking for ways to kind of duplicate that. And he found that these binaural beats really helped to quiet that neocortex. And I was using them, as I said, to quiet the mind. And I had already begun developing with my business partner, Kevin Cossey these types of recordings that we were using for our own personal journeys. And when we met Eben, we invited him as the third human on earth to listen to these recordings. We invited him to listen. And he found they were very effective at taking him back to those expansive states of awareness. And that's when he invited me to help teach other people how to use them. And Anna, you did a study on this. Can you talk to us about that and what you found? Absolutely. And so, as a psychiatrist, my patients are always looking for complementary and alternative ways to deal with the problems that they come to me with. And those problems include depression, anxiety, panic, unwanted thoughts. And so, yes, we have the typical tools of psychiatry, which include therapy and medication, but there are so many other things, including meditation. And I've been very interested myself in the spiritual component of psychological and psychiatric experiences. So meditation has always been so interesting to me. And then learning about the binaural beat meditations that Karen and Evan were doing, and the fact that it actually enhances people's capacity to get the effects of the meditation more thoroughly, you know, quicker, and to be able to really elevate their consciousness at the same time, I thought this is something I really want to offer to my patients. And moreover, I want to study, is there an effect here that we can then publish and that we can build upon? So in my practice, I invited um, a number of my patients who were interested to be part of the study, and we used the binaural beats that Karen and Eben had. Some patients did only you know, therapy and uh, therapy or a psychiatric treatment as usual, which was therapy and medication if they were on medication. Some patients did the treatment as usual plus meditation. And then we had another control group that just did meditation. And we found the results that in both the meditation only group and the psychiatry only group, patients' anxiety improved. That was the parameter we were looking at, anxiety. But then in using the two together, when you have psychiatric treatment as usual, plus meditation, there was a synergistic effect that the improvement there was greater than the sum of the two parts. Those patients really made headway above and beyond the other groups. And so what it showed us is that there's something that's really, really amazing in the context of therapy to be able to use these kinds of meditations. And there's this beautiful synergistic effect. So this is just obviously an initial study. Many more studies need to be done to validate the effect, 
but my patients loved it. They had positive results and it was very easy to implement. And what other conditions would you um, recommend that people use this with besides anxiety? There has been a ton of data showing that in so many different psychological, you know, states of despair, whether it be anxiety, depression, panic, or whether people want to just get to a higher level of their own expanded consciousness, like Eben and Karen described, they want to be able to touch and connect to their own subtle energies. They want to improve their intuition. They want to elevate their consciousness. They want to do away with unwanted thoughts. They want to get closer to, you know, experiences that a lot of the yogis and gurus describe of nirvana, of enlightenment. This is the path. It's not a quick path necessarily, but it is the path. And it really helps um, people along on their journey. Well, that's wonderful. I'm very excited about this and to, um, to bring it to the public because I think this is something that everybody needs to listen to and, and do. Um, were you guys musicians before you started this? <laughs> That's a very mm -hmm. funny question because we're not, we're not musicians. Neither is Kevin Clossy, who is the primary audio engineer. He's a mechanical and electrical engineer. But I think that what allowed us to kind of really approach this differently was the fact that we were not music professionals. We weren't locked into music theory and the way music was created. We were working from a mathematical perspective, an engineering perspective. And at the same time, we were sort of bringing in spiritual concepts into kind of what people would really hear that we're creating the binaural beats with and what the verbal guidance was and so on. Go ahead, Eben, did you wanna say? As, as a user, I would simply add that uh, from my point of view, um, and I've listened to uh, other forms of binaural beats, uh, different from sacred acoustics. But the thing that I find so amazing about sacred acoustics is the way, and I believe this is due to the fact uh, that uh, Karen and, and Kevin yeah. uh, used harmonic principles to unite every single sound that is there, the natural sounds as well as uh, the binaural beat tones. Uh, and they, they then take on a very beautiful musical quality because in fact, other binaural beats that I've tried that did not use such principles, uh, they actually have to cover up the, the uh, binaural beats with white noise or pink noise, different mathematical forms of noise, so they're easier to listen to. Whereas with sacred acoustics, because of the harmonic principles that are involved at the get-go, you don't need that. So they do sound very musical and kind of appealing to the ear. What if someone is deaf? Can, can do the vibrations help? Or well, we've had different people with different levels of hearing loss, sometimes just in one ear, sometimes both ears, and it really just depends on the individual. Everyone is unique to start with and will respond differently when listening to these recordings, although within a wide range of potential experience. But people with hearing loss, they just need to try it for themselves. And the, uh, some people do experience quite amazing effects and others don't. And so it's really easy to try for yourself. You just go to sacredacoustics.com, look for the free download, enter your email, and we'll send you a free 20 minute recording so that you don't have to buy something to find out how it works. And that applies whether you have hearing loss or not. The opportunity to try it is there for everyone. And of course, with headphones. Headphones yes, are the we, best way yes. to get the full uh, effect. And that is because binaural beats are created with one frequency in this ear, a slightly different frequency in the other ear. And so you really need to be be receiving both signals from the left and right channels in order for this to work. Now, some people do use speakers and we include monaural beats as kind of an extra boost. And uh, that helps with the speaker delivery. But if you are using speakers, you wanna make sure you have two speakers, not these fancy little one speaker systems that combine the left and right channels, but two speakers and position yourself between uh, either of them. And that can work quite effectively yeah. as we found e e ourselves and also at events with dozens speakers. or hundreds of people, we use those speakers and people are able to have rather powerful effects. Where can people go to download the Sacred Acoustics? Well, sacredacoustics.com is the location where all the files, all the recordings are available for purchase and there are short samples and descriptions of each one. And uh, I wanted to also 
bring up some other applications that people can use this for. We've heard just story after story of people kind of letting us know how they've been able to use these. And we have heard from two different acupuncturists that are in two different states here in the US. And uh, they both work with children, teenagers who have attempted suicide and failed. So they're still with us, they're getting therapy and they use acupuncture and many other therapies in these two centers they work in. And when they're delivering their acupuncture, they started using sacred acoustics recordings while their patients were lying there with the needles in them. And when they started using these recordings rather than other types of music, they found that these patients started saying things to them like, oh my gosh, I feel this amazing connection to the universe I've never felt before. If only I had felt this before I tried to kill myself, I never would have tried. That is an amazing thing to hear from a young person in that kind of therapy. Likewise, we had someone who was blind, who lived over, lives over in the Netherlands, and she was completely blind, and, but she had a cane and she could walk outside. But occasionally she would run into like branches or signs that were up higher than her cane would be able to, to sense. And so she started uh, developing incredible anxiety just about walking outside and having to have someone help her all the time. And it was very debilitating. And so she started walking on a treadmill while listening to our recordings. And as she walked on the treadmill listening, she would imagine herself outside, feel some anxiety coming up and then allow the tones to bring her into that profound state of relaxation and keep walking. And she found over time, and she developed this all by herself. Nobody told her to do this. So there's lots and lots of ways, but she let us know that she's now able to walk around outside without that anxiety. So lots and lots of ways to use these recordings. I could, I have tons of more stories as well. So, so for someone like me, who is petrified of inoculations, and seriously thinking about getting the COVID vaccine, I would listen to this and then picture myself receiving the vaccine and not being in pain. Sure, that is absolutely one way to do it. And I, I've had some, another person tell me that they listened to one of our recordings with headphones, but on very low volume as they go about their daily tasks. And he finds that it helps with his neuropathy that constant kind of pain uh, from nerves. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And so he finds great relief from that. And, you know, we don't recommend that, but it's working for him. So we always encourage listeners to use some trial and error, combine it maybe with other breathing techniques or maybe mantras that you, that you work with. If you have no practice at all, just start listening. And uh, the recordings that Anna used in this pilot study, we've made available to the public. And if you go to our website, look for the whole mind bundle. And it includes all nine recordings we used in the pilot study and a booklet that will explain all the best listening practices. Because while you're listening, passive listening offers a certain level of relaxation, but using intention and you know, watching that inner observer and, and all kinds of other things can be going on in your mind, which add to the potential effects. And uh, so, so oh that whole God. mind bundle, sorry, I wanted to say is currently specially priced. Uh, about a year ago when COVID started or nine months, I guess, uh, we reduced the price to just $19 and also a free option for anyone in economic uncertainty who, who would like to, you know, use a tool to relax. We thank you for doing that. We want to offer those to people, especially those who are anxious with financial issues, because as each of us can kind of calm our state of mind and bring that inner peace to our inner consciousness, we're actually contributing to the entire collective consciousness of all of humanity. So we thank anyone with our deepest gratitude who takes the time to do that. Well, thank you for putting that out there for people. Anna, how has the scientific community accepted your study? Have you gotten I think people have been very open to it <clears throat> and quite excited about it because it's a pilot study, meaning that it's not a the highest standard of a scientific study, which is a double blind placebo controlled study, 
but it's an initial study showing that the effects are there. And now we need to design the next level of study, which would be a placebo controlled double blinded study. So oftentimes you'll start with something small like this and then build on. And really, the scientific community has responded to this in a similar way that it did to my book. When my book was written, it was on the science of spirituality, and I anticipated that I would get a lot of negative feedback and colleagues not accepting that, but actually the exact opposite happened. And colleagues, I think, were very hungry for this information and very interested in it. And I went to medical school at Yale, but I was asked to join the faculty only after my book came out. And so the fact that they were open to that and then wanting me then to start a spirituality mental health center, to me shows that even our top elite institutions really, really are looking to bridge science and spirituality and need and want studies like this and are looking for clinical ways to help patients without medications, to help people get off medications, to help people deal with difficult affect states in these more evolved, enlightened ways. I think that's so exciting. It just shows where we are in our evolution, that it's finally being accepted. Eben, you talk about um, using this and remote viewing. Can you speak a little bit about that? Well, what I was referring to there is just uh, some observations from people who were very active in remote viewing, like the Stanford Research Institute, uh, Joe McMonagall and others um, who were uh, very involved in that program for decades. Uh, like back in the like 70s. Yeah, back 70s, in the 70s and 80s. 80s. And 80s. It for some people uh, who may not know what remote viewing is. Yeah, remote viewing, uh, some people uh, call it, refer to it as psychic spy programs, but the the reality is it's a, a proven technique of people um, getting into a certain mental state where they can discern information at a distance. Uh, and in fact, in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, we go into detail about remote viewing and talk about some of those amazing successes um, uh, in the kind of national intelligence arena, like finding a Russian bomber that had crashed in, in Africa, um, uh, identification of various weapon systems in the Soviet Union, things like that that were very successful. Um, and then also, for example, one of the remote viewers who, who saw the rings of Jupiter, he saw a bluish ring of Jupiter six years before the Voyager spacecraft flew through and witnessed the blue inner ring of Jupiter. So it's uh, amazing. They would Remote viewers would tell you that their work is done outside of space and time, outside of the here and now of the body. Um, and in fact, remote viewing uh, um, uh, got a tremendous um, a positive accolade from Jessica Utz, who was, and we mentioned all that in Living in a Mindful Universe too, but she was the head of the American Statistical Association back in uh, uh, 2015. And when she gave the presidential address to 6,200 people, scientists and statisticians from around the world from 62 different countries, uh, she, she talked about her work, not only in remote viewing, but in precognition and said that the statistics support the reality of it beyond any reasonable doubt. And in fact, when you do the numbers, the statistics are out there at kind of billion to one odds that the remote viewing successes have been just by chance. Uh, and so it really has been proven very strongly. But interestingly, uh, Dr. Utz in that address also mentioned that for most of her colleagues, uh, when she asked them, well, what do you want, more data or a personal experience to know the reality of things like precognition and remote viewing? And she said almost uh, every one of them said, I'd rather have the personal experience. Uh, and if she asked them if they'd reviewed the data on remote viewing, they'd say, no, I'd never read that stuff. Uh, so it was very unscientific, their approach to this. And yet the scientific side, the statistical side is really beyond doubt. Uh, it shows one, one of the problems with, for example, Wikipedia to this day says remote viewing is a pseudoscience, uh, but they obviously aren't aware of the head of the American Statistical Association's work over several decades and confirming that it's absolutely beyond reasonable doubt. So remote viewing is just a means of, of discerning information at a distance, uh, but Karen's quite good at it. And, and I just wanted to add that um... Everyone can remote view. Evan mentioned all of these kind of more exotic things, but remote viewing is a really wonderful way to just confirm your own intuitive abilities. And it's something that you can validate in the moment. So the kind of remote viewing I'm referring to is when you put like some image into an, a sealed envelope and on the outside of the envelope is a six digit number. 
And then the person who's doing the viewing tunes into that number. And the idea is to just kind of draw or get impressions, not to describe, but just to, I'm, I'm sorry, not to define, but to describe. And so this is a way of sort of tapping into what we call the right brain instead of the left analytical brain, more the kind of receptive right brain. And when you can receive that kind of information, you find that you can be quite accurate over time. And when you can see that image pulled out of that envelope and see what you were able to pick up, it is a remarkably effective way at validating and gaining confidence in your own intuition. That's how I used it for many years. But important to point out in all this discussion of left brain and right brain, obviously the information you're getting is coming from an information field that is independent of your brain and body and of the here and now. Uh, and that's really what we're talking about with all of this, whether it's remote viewing or whether it's healing, uh, reducing anxiety. I mean, I would say that uh, these techniques are very powerful just for awakening the placebo effect in anyone. Placebo effect has been acknowledged by medicine for more than six decades as the gold standard. It's simply an acknowledgement of <clears throat> the power of our beliefs, thoughts, and attitudes to influence our state of, of health and healing. Uh, and I believe that this, uh, these kind of tones are a way of thinning the veil by getting in touch with that information field, just like in the remote viewing process, that information field holds all potential for healing. And uh, so that's how people can access it. It's a kind of an astonishing mode of getting in touch with kind of the mind of the universe. So when you use the beats to go back to your NDA, did you go back to the memory or did you actually go there again? That's an excellent question because the astonishing thing is I've, I've used these tones and these meditations to return to my NDE, not just to recover memories, but to actually develop relationships and to live with that world, develop, uh, for example, um, you know, the beautiful guardian angel on the butterfly wing that I talk about in Proof of Heaven. I've developed a very profound relationship with her. Uh, and but tell me it's not the same. Yeah, the, well, the important, yeah, that, that's one thing to point out is even though I have developed a much stronger and richer relationship with that era, with that region, with those realms, and this is why I encourage people to do this, because I would say you don't need an NDE uh, to get all this information. We all, as conscious beings, have the ability to go within and learn the same things that I learned in my NDE. Uh, but as Karen is pointing out, I will confess, I have not yet duplicated the full-blown ultra reality, that sense of way too real to be real, uh, that was a hallmark of my NDE. And it could be, I have to wait till the next time my entire neocortex is offline to get that kind of a, a beautiful, rich, uh, complete overlap with that spiritual higher soul. Uh, but I definitely have uh, developed a far better relationship with that infinitely healing God force and with the various uh, entities that I encountered in that. And a lot of that, again, is covered in our book, Living in a Mind Free Universe. So do you, when you do something like that, you do it with an intention? You set out an intention? Yes, I think an important thing to point out is uh, one of the primary goals here is to take that little voice in our head, our little running stream of thoughts, the ego mind, and put it into timeout because that is not really who we are. And the, the mystery, the scientific mystery of consciousness is really about that awareness. And in fact, we're all sharing in a kind of a self-awareness the universe has as a fundamental principle. Uh, and that's what we're really trying to do. And so for me, it's all about quieting that little voice in the head and then developing that relationship with that observer self. That's the part of us that gets much grander when we leave the physical body at the time of death. But we can work on that, uh, developing that relationship um, uh, even now. And so I would say uh, putting that linguistic voice uh, into timeout and then exploring consciousness by writing these tones um, is a very powerful way uh, to access that kind of will of the universe in determining our own kind of course. But the important thing to remember is it's always about love and compassion and kindness for self and others. And the more we can kind of harbor that emotional depth of, of that kind of love and uh, caring for others, uh, the more we can bring that loving force as a healing force into this universe. And I think meditation of uh, sacred acoustic stones are a beautiful way to kind of enrich our relationship and, and allow that kind of higher soul 
uh, and primordial mind to come into our awareness and show our true capabilities. So obviously this can really help people um, during the pandemic that we're going through right now. And if more people do it, it's like a domino effect, the more healing will roll out, which I think is pretty wonderful. Anna, have you seen any of your colleagues starting to use this? Um, definitely. There's a lot of doctors starting to do, I guess you call it either functional medicine or integrative medicine. And in all different fields of medicine, people are starting to integrate these. I have a number of friends and colleagues doing it. In my own profession within psychiatry, the majority of people are still more traditional, relying on psychopharmacology or medications and therapy. And, you know, they'll certainly tell their patients to meditate, to do yoga, they're not going to be anti that, but it hasn't yet been the standard of care. And I think over time, some of what's now considered complementary and alternative really will be more the standard of care for things like anxiety and depression, especially now, especially, you know, people are saying that the next pandemic after our pandemic is the mental health pandemic. And this is with so much depression, anxiety, suicides, like we've never seen before. People need tools like this. And to mention, you know, in our study, the effect we saw in terms of the reduction in anxiety was seen from two weeks of doing these meditations 20 minutes a day. So even two weeks, a two week commitment could have a really, really profound effect. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, what I think is so wonderful is that the medical community is beginning to embrace it because, you know, the, between, we're more than just these physical beings. And I think it's just wonderful that, you know, you're bringing it forward in, in that way and it's embraceable and it's simple. It, these are not things that are so complicated, you know, where people have to sit and read volumes and volumes of books on, on how to do that. They just need to listen and let themselves go, which sometimes to some people is, is kind of difficult. Um, but if they keep it simple, I'm sure they can, um, they can get there. Is there anything else that you would like to add to this conversation that I didn't ask that you wanna highlight? Well, I think another uh, really huge benefit of the sacred acoustics recordings, one that I personally experienced and many others as well, is that listening to these recordings seem to, without me, without my intention, activate emotions that were uh, surprising to me. And so over time, I realized that these were stored emotional traumas that I had kind of put away much earlier in my life that never really processed. And so listening to the recording, some people will say, oh my gosh, these recordings are making me feel anxious. And I'm saying, no, no, that's just triggering anxiety that's already in your system. And so the advice that I got and give to others is to, when those feelings arise, is to recognize them as your own, but then allow them to dissipate and release. Allow yourself to feel that feeling uh, and not just put it, stuff it back inside of yourself, but feel that feeling, even, uh, even if it's challenging. Now, some people who have kind of some extreme uh, emotional abuse that's been very, you know, very covered up, that you definitely want to probably be working with a therapist for that, because I, I know that if you're touching some of those real extreme emotions, doing that on your own can sometimes not be as effective. But many of us who just have kind of, you know, arguments we had with our parents when we were 10, and somehow that stayed with us, those are the kinds of things we're talking about. And when you can start to allow those things to release, those feelings kind of evolve into other feelings. And eventually, if you sit with it long enough, you come to this sort of neutral, more pure state where you're just kind of sitting in uh, your own presence. And that's really the goal is to just allow those uh, other feelings to release so that you can really identify with that essence, that essence of your spiritual nature that so many of us really don't pay much attention to on a regular basis. And so that's another value of these recordings that some might find very useful. One other thing I'd like to point out about all this, and it concerns some studies uh, that have gone on the last few years <clears throat> using uh, psilocybin, using magic mushrooms. Uh, and the reason I bring this up is because I believe, believe there's some powerful parallels to what we're talking about with using tones. Uh, and the, and the, the, the mushrooms have been used in a therapeutic setting, especially in the setting 
of uh, very strong addictions like nicotine, opioids, things like that. And also in the setting of cancer patients with a, a crippling fear of death. And what's been found is that, that a single dose of, uh, of psilocybin um, seems to have a dramatic effect that can last for months or years that alleviates uh, kind of that addiction mode and alleviates that, that fear of death. And, and when you look at kind of the therapeutic protocols that are, that are built around this, it becomes apparent that um, uh, in many ways, they're doing something like what we're proposing with these tones, and that is thinning a veil that allows you to get in touch with a, a kind of a higher soul aspect of yourself that takes a much deeper look at your life and your principles and values and allows you to manifest those uh, in your living. And uh, I know that, for example, psychedelic drugs and binaural beat tones were compared very directly by Christopher Bache, B-A-C-H-E, in his book, Dark Night, Early Dawn, that came out about 15 years ago, uh, where, and he was using high dose LSD for spiritual journeying, but he said that he had very favorable results with the sound alone, with differential frequency sounds. And he was using a, a much more primitive form of binaural beat brainwave entrainment. Uh, so I think along the lines of, you know, in addiction medicine, we often talk about a kind of the gift of desperation and a higher power that you turn your life over to. I think that what these tones are doing is basically enabling us to get in touch with that kind of higher soul, leave the ego mind behind, uh, and therefore have a much more powerful uh, kind of um, ally in our higher soul uh, that helps us to become more whole and complete. And that involves healing in many different ways. Um, uh, and I, of course, I'm not advocating the casual use of psilocybin or similar drugs, but just pointing this out uh, because I think these scientific studies are very helpful. And I just do have another thing, and Anna probably does as well, but I, I, you all should probably know that Anna, Dr. Yusum, Eben, Dr. Alexander, and myself, we created an online course titled Spirituality and Mental Health. And it was designed for practitioners, but uh, anyone could take it. Uh, it. It's not solely for practitioners, but it really teaches people. I guess Eben could probably say what he spoke of. Anna can speak to her, you know, psychiatric expertise. But I brought the... Uh, information about the tones, how they work, how can, they can be applied, the kinds of responses people might have, what to expect, how to coach your clients with listening. And so Eben, what did, tell us what you contributed to that course. Well, it's, it's a nine hour video course. And it's, uh, from my point of view, it's very rich with a, a full set of principles and practical tips uh, uh, that come from all three of us that really kind of add up to a very powerful paradigm for healing and for moving forward with healing. And it, as Karen points out, it is packaged in such a way that people without medical training or know-how can actually take a lot of these lessons to heart. So I think uh, from my point of view, it's a very valuable addition. Uh, and, and really my part of it was really going from soup to nuts about this uh, shift in worldview and the, in the world of consciousness, science of consciousness, uh, that I think bears heavily on the benefits that might come out of this kind of a uh, program. Well, I'm absolutely going to take that. I'm going to fit that into my spare time. Well, um, Anna, why don't you uh, tell us, uh, just in, I want to tell people where to find it. The easiest way to find it is becomingmorewhole.com. But Anna, tell us what you brought to that, your beautiful contribution. Absolutely. You know, when working with people and as people are trying to get past what it is that pains them, ultimately people come to my door in some sort of pain, whatever that pain is. And we try to work with that pain on many different levels. First, there is the psychological level. And that entails really the level of the mind. What are the thoughts or cognitions we have that are somehow undermining us or might not be the most adaptive way of seeing a situation or of understanding our past? So part of therapy is finding new meaning, creating new meaning, creating a new narrative that's more adaptive, that serves somebody more, and letting go of those narratives that no longer serve somebody. So that's at the cognitive mind level, psychological level. But then there's a deeper form of healing, and that's more at the emotional or heart level. Some people call it the soul level. And that's what something like meditation starts to do. That heart change is really about how do you access that? You can access it through a deep connection with another person, through a connection with the divine, 
what is it that you know enables people to feel passion, love in that way that really opens their heart? It could be a new baby. It could be um, somebody who inspires them in a deep way. It could be meditation that change their heart and mind in such a way that suddenly they feel more connected to the divine whole or to the whole of what is. So that's, it's actually interesting because in our study, when we looked at anxiety, there were two types of anxiety that we were looking at. State anxiety, which is how you feel in a given moment, and trait anxiety, which is one's overall propensity to feel anxiety over time. Like some people are a little bit more anxious, some are less anxious. And what we found was, although therapy impacted state anxiety, how somebody feels in the here and now, you have a good therapy session, you know, and they feel good, and that's great, that's what therapy does. And over time, perhaps it can change trait anxiety, but meditation have an effect on trait anxiety in the here and now. So two weeks of meditation actually changed people's baseline of anxiety, which is a very powerful and important finding. And so something happens through, you know, the effect on the brainstem that it goes and impacts our heart and touches our soul. And there is a change in somebody's whole being. So I think together, the psychological and cognitive part with that emotional soul part is, you know, what is needed for comprehensive change. And to see this change, how many minutes of meditation would you recommend somebody do a day? Well, usually, you know, for advanced practitioners for whom it's been a lifelong journey, people could do it for several hours a day. But for our study, we did 20 minutes once a day. And a lot of advanced practitioners do 20 minutes twice a day. And the effect in our study was seen after just two weeks. So 20 minute commitment for two weeks, you have an effect and that's powerful. Yeah, that's wonderful. And it's not that much time. Everybody can set aside 20 minutes without question. Okay, well, I thank you all so much for coming on today. I think you're bringing a light, enlightenment and awareness to the world. I so appreciate your work. Um, so until the next time, and I'm sure there will be. Um, God bless you all. And thank everyone for tuning in to today's episode. Please like, share, and comment. And please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. And please go to the websites that we mentioned before, during this conversation that we have, where there is a host of information that can help you grow and learn and become who you are on a deeper level and who you're meant to be. So thank you all very much for coming on today. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much.